Jared, to understand what are persons. I've talked to philosophers who have very uh, technical and disaggregating ways of understanding the, the nature of a person. Neuroscientists who talk about if you lose different parts of your brain, how are you still a person? I'd like to come to you in, from a totally different perspective and look at diverse societies in the world, from uh, primitive societies to developed societies, and try to understand in those different societies, how, what does it mean to be a person? C can we learn something in the differences or the similarities? This question of differences and similarities between different societies is one that fascinated me and where I went through a series of what I would now consider naive points of view. When I first went out to New Guinea in 1964, um, I had lived in the United States and in Europe. My only previous experience of a more traditional society was in 1963 when I spent a summer in Peru, which fascinated me. And the following year I went to New Guinea naive, thinking these people are going to be like nobody that I've ever encountered before. I remember thinking, New Guineans, I'll find some New Guinean who knows how to read minds and will teach me how to read <laughs> minds. Okay, so I went out there and rather quickly I came to the conclusion, no, people are people. They speak languages like, they're different but they're like the languages that I was used to. They laugh, they smile, they cry, they have children, they're old people. So. I then came to the view that persons are persons all around the world, that everybody is the same and there really aren't basic differences. And then gradually as I got to know New Guineans better, I realized that there are cultural differences, profound cultural differences, so profound in fact that I didn't notice them for years because they involved questioning or doing differently things that I never imagined could be done differently. Because one example that really struck me was had to do with friendship. I think of friendship as being a human universal. Yes. Everybody has friends. And I, I remember an incident in New Guinea in which I was with a New Guinean whom I thought I knew really well. I had known him for eight years in a life-threatening situation. We had cried and rejoiced together, so I thought I knew him really well. And we were visited by a European teacher who stayed with us for a week and became friends with this New Guinean. And then the European teacher went off and, and said to the New Guinean, as he, as one would seem normal, um, yeah, I enjoy being with you. Come visit me when you come through my town. Mm -hmm. And he said, sure. And then when the teacher went off, I asked my New Guinea friend, so are you going to visit that guy? And the, my New Guinea friend's answer was, visit him? What for? Are you crazy? What for? I mean, if he offered me a job or if there was some advantage, yeah, I'd visit, but visit him just for nothing? For, and he used the New Guinea expression, belong friend nothing, just for friendship? What a stupid idea. <laughs> and I realized that the concept of friendship in traditional New Guinea was, was different. Um, one has defined relationships with people. You don't just make friends with a person with whom you have no defined relationship. Yeah. So the concept of friendship is different. The concept of childhood is different. The concept of old age are different. How is, how is uh, childhood and old age different? Again, an example with, with childhood that, that struck me in New Guinea. When I first went out there, I noticed in the Highlands that, that everybody had scars on them. They were fire scars and I thought, okay, th these are people who heat, them, who heat up their houses with mm. fires and yeah, so there are occasional accidents. Most of those fire scars are not acquired as an adult. Most of those fire scars are acquired as a child or a baby because the view in the Highlands is that, that children and babies, they're autonomous creatures who can make their own decisions and that includes making their own decisions about playing close to a fire and if a baby is playing close to fire, it's the baby's decision if it wants to be incautious. And it will have to learn from its own, own mistakes. So uh, again, um, another example is that 
the, their friend working in a remote area of the Amazon was interviewing a woman who had a two-year-old child, and the two-year-old child had a long, really sharp knife, and the child was playing with the knife and, and moving it around close to parts that you would not want chopped off or perforated. <laughs> but the woman didn't, the mother didn't interfere, and the child dropped the knife, and the, my friends thought, aha, she's going to take the knife away. She picked up the knife. What does she do? She gives it back to the child. Uh -huh. So there's a basic view in many traditional societies that children are autonomous creatures whose will should not be thwarted, and they got to learn from their mistakes. They're not mollycoddled as are our own children as they grow up. Uh, you know, th th that is, is something that we would have thought would have been a natural tendency that it would be a universal. And to, you know, is that, is that goes throughout? those societies, or, or that was just isolated examples? That's very interesting. It's not a universal. Um, different societies differ in the freedom that they grant to children. Hunter-gatherer societies generally gives children a lot of autonomy. Farming societies, depending upon the farming society, herding societies tend to give children much less autonomy. The Part of the explanation depends upon how much damage a kid can do. Uh, if to, the, to, to itself or to, or to the community? To the community. Uh -huh. yeah. If the community has nothing valuable, then yeah, a kid can hurt itself, but the attitude is the kid will have to learn from mistakes. But if this is a herding society with pastures and gates, and a kid who's incautious uh -huh. and leaves the gate open, out could walk all those valuable cows and walk uh -huh. away, uh -huh. then you really have to, to restrict the options of children if they can do damage. So, in short, there are differences among societies in the freedom given to children, depending upon a number of things, such as the amount of damage the children can do, and also the danger of the environment. Well, how about to the child itself? What is the motivation? Is the motivation uh, some, uh, some thoughtful motivation that this will help the child learn how to navigate for itself in the world uh, and, and more quickly and be able to function independently of the parent? Uh, or is it just a total laissez-faire that, that uh, the child is independent and if it does something terrible to itself, well, that's the, way, that's the way the world is supposed to be organized? It would be closer to your first formulation, but I would say less, less, less rational on the one hand and more stemming from a deeply held philosophy. The deeply held, held philosophy in traditional small-scale societies is that, that every individual is responsible for themselves and their, their actions have consequences, that a baby and a child has have got to learn early on that actions have consequences. And yes, they may make mistakes. Sometimes the parents will intervene, but a child has got to learn from its mistakes. And as the child makes mistakes, it will gradually realize that when the adults say, that's not a good idea, then the child will recognize that the adults may sometimes be right, but the child is going to, to incorporate that lesson only if the child has learned for itself that the adults really um, have something useful to say. And so it's a deeply held philosophy. And so what that would mean as a generalization is that when we think of the concept of, of person, there may be some cultural, uh, 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 barnacles on our definition, which can be um, eliminated by doing this comparative work. And the idea is, is when we reduce it down to what are the true universals that define persons, that it, those may be more limited than one society would 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 assume. Yes, and I would I would uh, formulate it by saying that two of the things that I learned in New Guinea is that there. There really are human universals, that people with stone axes in many respects are not that different from us. And on the other hand, there really are profound differences among people in things that one would think would be rather basic, such as friendship, such as love of one's spouse, such as what you do, do with your children, such as what you deal with old people, things that you would think would be basic to human society, but those basic things can differ.